All righty. So now, so the respiratory system, we start with the upper, right? The upper respiratory system, which consists of the nostrils, the nares, the nasal cavity, the nasal pharynx, the oropharynx, the laryngopharynx. Does everybody understand me? When you hit the larynx, well, the larynx has what? It's top, the epiglottis. Don't forget that the underside of the epiglottis has the same lining as the larynx. Same lining as the larynx. Pseudostratic by ciliated columnar epithelium with goblet cells. From the upside of the epiglottis, it's the same as what, what lines the oral cavity, the tongue. They understand the oral cavity, which is non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. They understand? Non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium of the oral cavity. Esophagus, same thing. Non-keratinized. Means it's wet. It's moist. And anything that's wet, moist, damp, and dark, right, is you don't have bacteria. Separately, the tube always wants to be contracted. Does everyone agree? And we talked about this in respiratory. The tube wants to be contracted, but we have devised a way to prevent it from contracting at least transiently. Because we do need it to contract back, and that's exhalation. That's why it's a passive process. Remember, we talked about that. Yes? So you got your larynx, and over here you got your esophagus. Esophagus leads to esophagus hits the diaphragm. Larynx, larynx then splits up into what? Trachea. Huh? Larynx, trachea, and then primary bronchi, secondary bronchi. Tertiary bronchi, terminal bronchioles, T bronchioles, respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, sacs, and then alveoli. So now watch, guys, watch. It's as easy as this. As easy as it is. The laryngopharynx, top side of the epiglottis, is consistent with that of the laryngopharynx. Non keratinized, right? Stratified squamous epithelium. Oral pharynx, same thing. Non keratinized, stratified squamous epithelium. Oral cavity, non, -stra non keratinized, stratified squamous epithelium. But when you get up here to the nasal cavity, the epithelium kind of changes. Especially up when you get closer to the cribriform plate where the olfactory nerves are. Did everybody hear me? There you'll find goblet, you'll find large numbers of goblet cells with cilia on them. Did everybody hear me? Associated with the cranial nerves of the ethmoid bone, which are cranial nerve number one. What does cranial number one have to do with uh, digestion? What does cranial nerve number one have to do with digestion? Oh, I like that question. Cranial nerve number one. What does it have to do with digestion? What, what is it, first of all? Factories. Well, factories, yeah? My dog, he's got his old factory sitting out on his nosy, right? Ouch. Bumps his nose, it hurts. All of ours are buried deep in our cranial skull. In the ethmoid bone, the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. Everybody hear me? Those are for, for smell. Now, it winds up being that cranial nerve number one is linked to the hypothalamus, thalamus, yes? Because hypothalamus, thalamus, and the amygdala are all primitive brain structures, yes? And every, every creature on earth has the ability to smell, yes? So this cranial nerve number one is our purpose of smell. So that what? So we can stimulate. So we can stimulate GI. Did everybody understand it? You smell, take one good wolf of grandma's geese mm -hmm. on the way in, right? On the way in, not on the way out. On the way out, you're hating it. Right. 
Because you smell it like Grandma's Giso on the way out. That's horrible, right? Better to be on your way in and on your way out because people are going to get offended. They think that, you know, that you like eating onions and you don't like taking showers, right? Right? Because it starts with garlic and onion. That's what it starts with. Right? So, cranial number one, you smell. Olfactory. When you smell things that are good, they're inviting. Think of ratatouille. I love Ratatouille. Ratatouille is one of my favorite movies. Yeah, he's show me some perspective, as he says, right? And I was like, uh, we don't serve that here, sir. Yeah, because he's a little on the low end of knowledge, right? So then he goes back in, and, and then Lugini comes out and serves him the plate, right? And what does he do? The first thing he does is he smells it. And that draws him closer to the table, so that he picks up his fork. He wants to pick up his fork and get closer to the table to taste it. Then when he tastes it, that combination of smell with taste rushes him back to his childhood. That's how strong, that's how strong, guys. These two, these two things, right? Smell and taste can have the profound effect that it can have on our brains. Do you understand me? This is all about comfort foods. You guys understand? When you feel bad, you know, you don't want to eat something strange. You want, you know, something that you know is going to taste good. You know, comfort foods. It has a lot to do with this. So, cranial nerve number one, guys, is the initiation of digestion. And it's called the cephalic phase of digestion. And it's in your textbook. Can everybody hear me? It starts with, oh, damn, that smells good. Does that make sense? It does, doesn't it? I don't want to teach you anyway. I'm going to teach you anyway. So it smells good. Then what? Then you're gonna then you're gonna taste it, right? Then you're gonna get closer. Let's get close, right? Then you're gonna taste it. Now, uh, when you taste it, who's responsible for taste? Oh, that's tongue. So let's draw the tongue. And let's split the tongue into an anterior two thirds. And the posterior one third, and then I'll turn to any one of my anatomy one students. <laughs> we have plenty out there, <laughs> right? <coughs> and I write up here: touch, taste, touch, taste, and I ask. Which cranial nerve is responsible for the touch of the anterior two-thirds of the tongue? And this is something you should already know. Is it nine? <laughs> Too far back. Seven? Who does sensation in the face? Five. Sensation in the face is seven? Five. Yeah. Five. What's the name of five? Tri trigeminal. What else does trigeminal do? Oh, Muscles of mastication. Oh, so are we talking about trigeminal nerve? Yes. Did everybody understand that? Touch? Five. Five. Taste? Seven. Fibers that piggyback on seven. Touch and taste of the posterior one third of the tongue. Glossal pharyngeal, which would be? Cranial nerve nine. Oh, 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 oh. Everybody see that? Huh? Oh. So when you go to chew, which cranial nerves are you using? Five. Five. Why? Uh, muscles of mastication. What are the what are the muscles of mastication? Ha ha! Gotcha, guys. Hey, I know you're in 286, but what's that? Oh, careful! Is the boostinator muscle mastication? No. What is it? Which is cranial nerve number? Five. Right? 
Facial expression, cranial nerve seven. Ah, so wait. So cranial nerve one, cranial nerve five, cranial nerve seven, cranial nerve nine, cranial nerve ten. Oh my gosh. All of them. All of them are involved with the beginning of actually chewing and eating. You understand that? Guys, this makes sense? Of course it does, because it all starts at this end. We don't chew with our asses, you understand? That'd be a neat trick, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> a neat trick. <laughs> a neat trick. We don't chew with our asses, do we? No, right? It'd be weird to see teeth out the ass end, right? I'm sure that'll make some kind of alien creature eat you with its ass or something like that, right? But just so you know, right? Because we all are shit eaters, right? I've got to tell you guys before. <laughs> Our first mouth is actually our anus in embryological development. So just another reason why <laughs> we would give ourselves the, the title, quote unquote, in capitals, right? In large, bold face, 24 font, shit eater, all right? <laughs> and we should all wear it with pride, all right? Big old, you know. So, any questions on this? <laughs> so, Kind of number five does the muscle mastication, the temporalis, the masseter, the internal, the medial and lateral pterygoid muscles. They allow for the elevation of the mandible and the shifting of the mandible. Oh my gosh, Professor P, did you do this to me? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. There's a reason why you did 285 before you did 286. There's a reason why you learned about bones and muscles and nerves before you came into this. So, oh, so then the oral cavity, the roof of the oral cavity, and the floor of the nasal cavity are shared by the maxilla and the palatine, which is the hard palate. Does everyone agree? Mm -hmm. So you see this being an issue for someone who has a cleft palate? When they go to eat, when they go to latch on for the first time as a child, the nipple and the milk winds up regurgitating into the nasal cavity. Now that may be great at first, you can't have that. And the baby's going to have problems learning how to speak and learning how to phonate, create his own words, and be able to correct himself because of inability of phonation and intonation. Because you need a hard palate for your tongue to bounce off of so that you can create the different sounds. Does everyone understand that? Make sense? Yeah. All right. So, hey, we go esophagus. Esophagus goes down the stomach. And that, that crosses the diaphragm. Esophagus stretches down, crosses the diaphragm, and it leads the stomach. Stomach leads the small intestine, first to the duodenum, then the ileum, sorry, the jejunum, <coughs> then the ileum. All right, <coughs> and then the cecum, the A colon, it's the ascending colon, the T colon, the transcending colon, the D colon, the descending colon, the S colon, the sigmoid colon, rectum, and then anus. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay so the one, one of the two things so when you go to swallow food here's the thing when you go to swallow cranial nerve 9 will sense the food bolus hit the uvula uvula will send that information back into the brain stem brain stem will kick an impulse out of cranial nerve 10 which will pull on the constrictor muscles that lift this whole structure, the trachea, the bronchi, up to the epiglottis. Did everybody hear me? And that way the food bolus is directed into the esophagus because why? We dilated the upper esophageal sphincter. Did everybody hear me? So there are several sphincters here. I'm going to draw them in. So between the esophagus, between the, the, the laryngopharynx and the esophagus, there is the upper <coughs> esophageal sphincter. Between the esophagus and the stomach, there is the lower esophageal sphincter. Between the stomach and the duodenum, there is the pyloric sphincter. Did everybody hear me? 
Then between the duodenum, jejunum, ilium, and cecum, there's the ileocecal valve. Then sigma colon, sorry, the cecum, A colon, T colon, D colon, S colon, rectum, anus, right here. There's the, there's two, two sphincters. Internal and an external. Smooth and skeletal. Internal, external. Those are anal sphincters, right? And of course, for most of us, right, um, the oral cavity has a sphincter, right? It's called your orbicularis oris. Of course, most people can't keep it shut, okay? Me and gluten. I just don't put food in it, right? I just spit too many words out. So, this is a sphincter, except it's what? A skeletal muscle sphincter I can control. You understand that? All these others, smooth muscle sphincters, guys. Smooth muscle sphincter, smooth muscle sphincter, smooth muscle sphincter, smooth muscle sphincter. Here, external, skeletal, anal sphincter. So, here's the thing internal, smooth, guys, smooth muscles, involuntary, involuntary. Involuntary. So when the poop starts peeping out, when you got peeping poop <laughs> out the poop chute, right? <laughs> what you gonna do? You squeeze the teeth and go running.